This is A Word Fitly Spoken, by words about reading the scriptures, about preaching the scriptures, and about the mission on which the scripture sends all of us. We here at A Word Fitly Spoken aim to give you, the servant of Christ, more and more always from the fullness the Lord has given us in His Holy Word. I'm Willie Grills, here with Zell and Heidi. Joining us today, extra special guest, regular, a norm, Adam Kuntz. Adam, welcome back. Hey, it's it's great to be here. That's the first time I've ever been called a normie, at least in many years. Well, not a normie. You're our, you're our norm. You can be Cliff if you want to. It's a Cheers reference. You know? Well, thank well, thank you. I <laughs> you know that there's a pop culture reference. It's very alienating for me, as you know. But just to, just to get on to regular subjects, the weather has been oppressively <laughs> hot here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But I am happy that you guys are letting me use the microwave at lunchtime here on the podcast. So, um, it's great to be back with you. Just be sure to mark all of your foods in the fridge. <laughs> Welcome here once again, Adam. You are not a normie. You are an eternal edgelord. And we're always privileged to have you with us. Stormy here in Iowa. That's about all we've got. The rain for the corn looking good. Soybeans. Uh, how about you, Zelwyn? Actually kind of cool today. I actually had to turn the heat on this morning since our house is basically a, a giant refrigerator. But <laughs> it's an igloo. <laughs> it's an igloo. Yeah, well, when, once the, the ice rolls in, then then we can start doing the igloo. But say so let me ask you this, Zelwyn. What's it like to build a house of sod? <laughs> Backbreaking. <laughs> Funny story is, is there's the the post office in the town where I serve, although it's uh, was last used in the seventies, was actually the last sod post office in the United States. So we really are out here in the states. I, that's that is so amazing. <laughs> living I, living. History. I don't even believe it's real, but I mean it's a good story. <laughs> It's a good story. I could get you pictures, but but anyway, Adam's not going to go out there to 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 check. So. <laughs> So yeah, so a bit of a milestone here. I believe this is our 30th episode. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Yeah, we wow. hit 30. Man, doing good. And we're continuing with CFW Walther tonight, particularly looking at his pastoral theology. The subject for this podcast is CFW Walther and marriage. Now that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, marriage is constantly talked about in media, uh, online and homes and everything. Uh, marriage really does make the world go round. It's been redefined and repackaged a lot over the years. However, I think that you're going to enjoy CFW Walther's traditional perspective. And really, he's going to be uh, giving us some stuff that might actually shock some of the audience. Would you guys agree? Yeah, totally. And I, I think that it's important to say at the outset how much Walther presumes about marriage, how much is implicit in the categories he uses that he really did not feel the need to discuss explicitly in his own time. Obviously, one of the things that he really doesn't have to spend much time discussing is how or why marriage is only between a man and a woman, but he doesn't even have to explain things like procreation or anything like that. There's a lot that he presumes. So if you are interested in a traditional Lutheran comprehensive discussion on marriage, There might be other places to look. I think Walther's fascination for us tonight is going to be in what he does spell out clearly, which is largely why marriage is such a perennial issue in the church and and what were issues for him. I think when you look at the past, it's especially enlightening to see what they struggled with in order to see, you know, not only the differences and, and what seems kind of quaint or odd from that time, but what is perennially difficult and hard, but worth sorting out for our own time as well. I like the way you put it of talking about the perennial issues, because, you know, we tend to think in our own time as if marriage has only really come under a ha- attack and from, you know, this time period. Like, this is right. the only time that it's ever been questioned. Right. But that's not the case, because, I mean, all throughout history, I mean, from the Reformation onward, which is what Walther is quoting from, they're dealing with different issues, yes, but they're still very significant ones, which shows that marriage has always been a a point of very serious discussion among the churches, I mean, for, for centuries. Yeah, I think when you think about your own time as somehow 
obviously unprecedented. There is something dizzying and even destructive about that thought because you think that you will have to come up with some unprecedented solution or you will be overwhelmed by unprecedented challenges. I think it's enlightening simply to think that because marriage is such a blessing from God, because it is a divine institution for the continuation of the human race, which has endured from paradise, it is obvious that in any time, by any means possible or available to him, Satan will want to destroy that institution. In our own time, that destruction has come about largely through public attacks on marriage. And we'll talk plenty about divorce later on in the podcast. But it's not like in previous times, there were not great assaults on marriage. I mean, it's it's really rather, when you look at some of the case histories that Walther brings up in his discussion, you're really sort of like shocked by how degenerate certain people were in the, you know, the 16th century. But, you know, human beings are are plagued by lust and the secrecy attendant upon lust. So it shouldn't really surprise us that marriage has always been under attack by Satan. And and just dealing with some of the issues then that, that Walther has here, Yes, he is still struggling with issues like divorce. And even if some of these things seem quaint to us, it does show that all of these things are still issues that need to be worked through because we have to take what the word of God says about marriage and apply it in a consistent and a a, uh, a clear way. Yeah, and clarity is especially important because Walther actually starts out his discussion at sort of a 10,000 foot view by talking about how and why the church even has anything to say about marriage. And this is, there is a canard that some of the listeners may have already heard. You certainly get this from sort of the left wing, or let's just say unbiblical wing of those who call themselves Lutherans, which is that Luther said that marriage was a civil matter Ergo, we simply follow whatever it is that the civil authority says is marriage. But Walther is very clear that marriage is divinely legislated. So he gives the example, for instance, the reason that pastors need to be intimately involved in the marriages of their members and make rulings on what ought to be and what ought not to be is that when asked to divide an inheritance between brothers, Jesus refuses and says, who has made me a judge over you. But when asked about marriage, Jesus provides clear direction about marriage and about divorce, as we'll discuss later. And this is particularly because, and I think that I'll let you guys jump in on this, marriage and having a good conscience about your life together with your spouse impinges very, very, very deeply on people's capacity even to enjoy being alive, if I could say it that way. <laughs> you know, and, and when he's discussing the sixth commandment in the large catechism, and Luther mentions sort of offhandedly about people who have broken their marriage vows, and he says, you know, in this sort of like big breezy way that he has, but there's kind of a lot to it sometimes, you know, Luther says, and I, and I know these people who have broken their vows, and they've never had another happy day in their lives. I actually, I mean, I totally concur with that. I don't know I don't know what you guys think, what your observations and experiences have been with people's consciences and, and marriage. Yeah, I would I would certainly agree with that statement. I mean, if only because when you're dealing with marriage, you're dealing with God's provision for the thing that affects us the most closely. I mean, yeah. if husband and wife are to become one flesh, you are dealing with the most intimate part of your life in having a wife. Right. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. If you're going to have qualms or troubles in your marriage, it is going to affect everything else because you're, I mean, you're affecting yourself in, in essence. Yeah. Willie, what, what about you? Oh, I'm just listening to the wisdom that you guys have. Uh, it, it is, it's eternally true. If you're miserable at home, you're pretty much miserable anywhere. Yeah. Now, that's not yeah. to say that the maxim "happy wife, happy life" is true. That's not. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying because yeah. that'll just make you even more miserable <laughs> if you just seek to simply <laughs> appease your spouse in, in whatever. We come across this so often today. This trope that 
marriage is a shackle and marriage is miserable and family life is miserable because one, that's what society's come to expect. And two, we take the institution of marriage so lightly that we enter into it without even giving it a second thought. I can just divorce later or I get married because that's what I'm supposed to do. So this person's here, they're available. They said, yes, okay, let's do it. The sense of duty is gone from marriage. Marriage is not simply two roommates, okay? Marriage is not simply your college roommate and then, you know, you do your laundry, she does her laundry. Marriage is meant to create families, and it does. The two shall become one flesh. It is the building block of society, but it also guards our salvation and keeps us, it's supposed to, keep us from committing evil. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and, and in that... There, there's a whole host of duty, and there's honor about this. What is the husband's duty? To honor his wife and protect and provide. But if you're just another dude, just kind of crashing, you know, in the same room with someone, it's just, it's not the same. It is a true marriage because God has joined it together. But as it functions in a lot of households today, it, it, it's not a biblical marriage in that sense. It is a true marriage. It is biblical. God has put it together. But I'm saying the mechanics of it do not look like what the Bible describes when it describes Christian marriage. Now, maybe maybe it's just the Southern thing in me that I always go back to honor and duty, but it is what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we have we have neither honor nor duty up here. I I I, you can apologies to Joshua Chamberlain. Yeah, there you go. Um, I. I wanted to kind of return to Zelwyn's mention of of the one flesh. And I I would say that in my experience, when people have problems in their marriage, I mean this quite literally, those problems often manifest in the same way that they do in the life of a person who has severe mental health issues. There's the same constant anxiety. There's the same inability to complete the most basic uh, tasks in life. And there's the same sense that everything else is clouded by this problem. Sometimes in a marriage, it can be submerged by the fact that, as you were saying, Willie, our society may condone a very unbiblical conception of marriage. So, for instance, Walther everywhere assumes what the Bible teaches, which is that the husband is the head of the household. If that is neither taught nor presumed and is, in fact, actively militated against by our society and people don't know what to think about marriage. And so they just kind of fall into that unbiblical pattern with the wife being the head of the household. In that case, they are unhappy and they don't even know why. Yeah. And it manifests. uh, And then you see it. You see, like, like you say, actual physical health problems manifest from this. It all kind of grows out of that. And and we're also starting to see an interesting phenomenon now. Okay, so you have the woman who's often head of the household or who runs the show. But now we're starting to see kids as head of the household (laughs) because they're elevated so high. Right. It's it's a bizarre phenomenon. You know, what do we do about it? Well, one, obviously, we go back to the scriptures and see what the scriptures say. And And I hope that's really our goal here when talking about Walter. Walter is thoroughly based in a biblical understanding of this. He doesn't presume... Any other format for marriage. Right. Not not at yeah. all. And, and, and really what he's going to exposit is going to be a lot for many people to swallow today. And that's the thing. The Christian life is a life of sacrifice, and marriage itself is a sacrifice rather than an indulgence. It's always portrayed as an indulgence in many ways, but it isn't. It's meant to be a life of, of mutual sacrifice. And what does that sacrifice look like? Well, Hours spent, you know, working to provide or working in the home, you know, to raise these children, to raise godly children, to raise a Christian family. It's a continual sacrifice. God calls Christians to give up their lives. And there are luxuries that Christian families will not get that the career-driven, secular, (laughs) dull, secular humanist family, family will get, quite honestly, simply because, hey, no children, more pocket money, we can do more we can do more things. Yeah, and I, I think I think if Christians don't understand, you know, what Jesus says when in speaking about the rich or those who have chosen their portion in this life that they have already received their reward, 
if we don't understand that they have set their minds on things below and we have set our minds on things above, then we will not be able to pursue a life of sacrifice. A Christian marriage is aimed at a higher goal, as you were saying, especially with raising godly children. When I'm sacrificing so that my children can be educated as Christians, and when I'm giving up time and they're giving up time to learn Christ's word, when we could be, I don't know, all watching some Hollywood program together and enjoying that just like everyone else does. When we're doing that, it's because we have set our minds on things above. We just have different goals as a family. And my wife and I have different goals in our marriage than people whose portion is in this life only. And I I think that's a great way of pointing out, too, that a biblical conception of marriage is not only for this life either. And what I mean by that is sometimes we can make marriage into a, a thing of this, you know, a thing of convenience. It helps us to pay the bills kind of a thing, <laughs> you know, so we don't have to pay two rents or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you got, yeah, there's so many tax incentives, right? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whereas God intends marriage to be a benefit not only to the family, but also to society as a whole. And if we're, we're using it as a building block for the church, really, and, and also for the witness of the church, I mean, the, the goals of a Christian marriage are not just directed entirely towards the self. I mean, also towards the greater church as well. I, th- I think that if we believe that somehow there was a time when this wasn't a struggle, like there was a time when, you know, and you can read Walther quoting a 16th or 17th century church order where they are upholding a far more stringent view of marriage than probably existed in most American states law ever. And you read that and you think, boy, I wish we had that. You know, I wish our society recognized that. I wish they understood biblical law and wanted to live by it, right? Even if only our church, let alone our state. I wish that was the case and I wish this was the case. That is that is to fail to see that the call to bear the cross in marriage and through marriage has always been one that Christians have to answer. There was never a time that was just automatically blessed by God that all the things that Walther is recording and the assumptions that he can make are because of the hard work of maintaining biblical standards for oneself for one's own marriage, and therefore for other marriages also in the church. And that's hard work of generation after generation after generation. None of this is automatic. All of this is difficult. All marriages take a lot of work, just like anything worth doing. And the reason that the standards that we're going to discuss in the next two segments are what they are is because our Lord places a high calling upon his children. He doesn't give us easy and low things to aim at. He gives us the very best things to aim at because we are seeking from him an eternal kingdom. And so we are seeking to model even now in our lives and in our congregations, his ways, because his ways are the ones that are eternal and the ways of the world uh, with its obsession with money and self-satisfaction and lust. Those are the ways that we know from his word shall perish. All right. And with that, we're going to take our first break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. The Word of God is the center of our faith life. Join us every Thursday for a new podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcasting app. Follow us on Twitter at WordFitly. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash WordFitly. And check out our website, wordfitlyspoken.org. We thank you for listening and stay tuned for more Word Fitly Spoken.
And we're back. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zelwyn Heidi, and Adam Kuntz talking about CFW Walter and marriage. So guys, let's jump right into this topic that gets a lot of ink, at least for this section, forbidden degrees. So what would that what would that mean in this context? This is about how high you can go as a Freemason and still be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. <laughs> Adam has reached the 33rd degree. Yeah, 33rd, but you, you can't go farther than that, and you're not allowed to go into any of those like weird research lodges or anything like that. So. Um, but you can enter the White Lodge if you're a Twin Peaks fan and a Missouri Synod Lutheran. So there, So there is that consolation. Forbidden Degrees is a biblical teaching about whom you may not marry. And there is a chart, if you buy the book on page 247, kind of an amazing chart in its comprehensiveness. And it says right in the middle in giant letters, do not marry. And then you kind (laughs) of figure out this chart in mathematical fashion. The simplest way to say it is that there are two different ways in which someone may be related to you and you may not marry him. The most obvious is within a common line of ascent or descent. So you may not marry your grandfather, you may not marry your daughter, anything like that. I know that that seems fairly obvious. And Walther refers to the law of nature and how every nation, and then he kind of qualifies it quickly and says, every civilized nation forbids (laughs) these things. You know, it really gets the old noggin joggin when you think about, well, I Maybe we're not civilized anymore because how long is it until Vox or HuffPo comes out with an article justifying this? You know, we'll we'll just have to see when we get there. It, it is interesting. Brother's Widow makes the list. Uh, that's kind of a tricky one. Yeah, biblically. That's a fun yeah one. because so the right. So the because the biblical term, which Walter brings up several times, the biblical phrase in Hebrew is flesh of flesh. So if you are already one flesh with someone you cannot become one flesh with someone who has become one flesh with that person. So that's why you don't marry your brother's widow because that person has already been joined to your brother. I I think that there's a a little, in quoting John Gerhard, Walther makes this point that God has set things up this way. And I, I can't believe that we have to explain this, but To be honest, there are cases of this that come up frequently enough that there is plenty of discussion on it in Walther's sources and in Walther. So, I mean, maybe it's always been something of a problem. God makes it this way because families need to basically be protected from anything being allowable while at the same time being families and being together. So it basically preserves the family unit from suspicion, upheaval, topsy-turviness by curbing what is possible. And th- this is where you really see the notion of if if our listeners, any, any are Lutheran and were catechized in kind of a traditional way, you know, the three uses of the law and the first use is the curb so that sin does just not, d- doesn't just like run rampant everywhere. This is a really good example of God's law as a curb where he has implanted a natural disgust for marriage or just sexual intercourse altogether with people to whom you are closely related. People are just disgusted by the idea, and rightly so. I think that like when we think about marriage today and people say, well, you know, you just have an irrational fear or distaste or disgust at name what it is, right? Pedophilia, homosexuality, whatever it is, right? You say, yes, I do. <laughs> God has implanted that disgust in me. Yeah, I am I'm disgusted, disgusted by de- deviancy. So yeah, it's- and it's right to be so. It is right to be so. So there, there is such a thing as a holy disgust. Hey, even the Lord will spit out those who are lukewarm, right? There you go. So if you have it, you have you. You literally have the Bible describing the things the Lord hates and detests. So we <laughs> ought, we ought to do. We can Likewise. do similar. And yeah, yeah, exactly. We should emulate him. It, it's interesting, cousins. Pretty safe. <laughs> yeah, right. But, right, and, I know. And, yeah. and, and we would sort of re- recoil at that a little bit, but it's it was the norm. And it's only, it was the norm even up in Walter's time, I assume in Germany too. Cousin marriage wasn't exactly that uncommon. But again, cousins are not in that direct line. This I think as far right. as this line goes down, 
other than the step other than step parents and step siblings is nieces and nephews or is the or is the book has it parents uh, or children of siblings which again if, if that doesn't cause you to retch a little bit at the thought you need to reorder your passions you know right <laughs> right and and it's interesting that that he and the Lutheran fathers whom he's quoting are drawing all of this from Leviticus and Deuteronomy and they're doing that w- really without qualification in order to say that the Mosaic law is a reflection of God's eternal will. And they are obviously basing not only the church's decisions, but also the, the civic law within the Holy Roman Empire and within their own individual states on that Mosaic law, really, really without qualification. That's important for listeners to understand because sometimes the church state relationship, which is obviously important with marriage, is portrayed within historic Lutheranism as if Lutheranism were kind of a Jeffersonianism avant la lettre, you know, <laughs> right, that, right. that we, we made up separation of church and state long before, you know, Washington uh, ever said anything or Jefferson ever wrote to the Danbury Baptist. Yeah, and then it becomes portrayed, even by well-meaning Christians, that any idea that biblical law would be the foundation for civil law is somehow legalism and anti-gospel or anti-Christian. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If if the law is God's will, and I assure you it is, then societies would do well to order themselves around it. And it's something that you see in Christian history whenever a society becomes overwhelmingly Christianized, the law changes. The the code of Justinian is not identical to the Roman civic law on which it is largely based because just human sacrifice ends in the new world. Yeah. Yeah. Because biblical law is instituted. There you go. There you go. Cortez did nothing wrong. So, (laughs) and so, and we're going to get letters. Um, (laughs) But it is true. I mean, I mean everywhere. And then you see it go perhaps a little bit to the extreme, you know, perhaps in England in some places, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't understand yeah. why you're qualifying at this point. Well, I'm just building up. I for think like we're already three. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm building up for episode 50 where I, it's all about blue laws and bringing them back. Seriously, folks, don't, oh, don't make feels... people work on the Sabbath. I know it's out of the bottle now. So. <laughs> um, I was, I was, I was going to mention too, that Walther is, when Walther does qualify that discussion of the law, it is to say that Amer- things are easier to get away with in America. For instance, when he's talking about impediments to marriage, and I know, Zell, when you want to get into that, so let's do that now. When he's talking about impediments to marriage, the traditional understanding is that for three Sundays prior to the wedding, in the time between the betrothal, which is understood to be a binding contract for marriage, and the marriage itself, the wedding itself, you publish the bans, right? And anyone who knows Victorian English fiction will will know what this is because it it happens in every novel that you know takes that has any kind of wedding. You announce the marriage and you say, you know, does anyone know any reason why these people should not be married? Is one of them a criminal? Is he a bigamist? Whatever it may be, the finish of that is when in the marriage ceremony, at least in the Church of England's service the priest asks one last time, speak now or forever or hold your peace because he's he's been asking, does anybody know, you know, if there's a problem with this? Walther says, well, in America, everyone's moving around all the time. So no one really has any idea who anyone else is. And this is a big problem. I mean, it is, I mean, it is kind of funny. I mean, of course it would be for him. He's, he's in the West and he got, he gets off a boat. So of course it's going to look that way. We did have still communities that go back generations. They're still there. It's pretty much the entire Eastern United States. But I understand what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. And it's true where he is. But yeah, let's, right. let's be fair here. You know, yeah. My ancestors yeah. have already been here a couple centuries. So I didn't move that far after, once they got out of Pennsylvania and Virginia. So, but, but, but the point still stands. Mistakes but were made, and, but then they stayed in Kentucky. But now we're colony posting. <laughs> yeah, we are. we are. Rest in peace. But, <laughs> but the, the, the point that you're, you're getting at here, Adam, and I think one that, I mean, we, we really only retain this whole notion of, does anyone have anything against this marriage? Almost purely out of tradition yeah, by this point. Right. Yeah, it's a formality. But it's actually a very real question that is, is wrapped up in all of this because 
we tend to see marriage as a purely individual affair, right? Like I'm going to get married and ain't nobody going to tell me what, you know, who I can't marry kind of a thing. Right. It's my special day. The heart wants what it wants. Yeah, that's right. Love (laughs) is love. Love is love, you know, all of this. So it's really all about the self. Whereas the whole, the whole notion of fitness in connection with marriage is really a notion that we've lost altogether. The idea that certain people are not fit candidates for marriage because marriage is not really about the self. Marriage is about the coming generations. It, it's not focused just on the now, but it's also looking forward to the future. I, I think that it is no no surprise that we struggle to uphold biblical standards for fitness for the pastoral office in a time and a place where we also struggle to uphold biblical standards for fitness for the estate of marriage. I think we we have a real difficulty saying that the estate, the office, the institution is more important than the individual and his personal desires, however disordered those may be. Uh, what I mean, what what are the what are some of the reasons someone is not fit for marriage? Well, the the ones that I think always kind of stick out when you have when you read somebody like Walther or the the old Lutheran dogmaticians, the one that always kind of catches me by surprise is fertility. Yeah, and I I mean that's I mean it's kind of a, a bomb to throw out there, but the the whole notion of if someone is incapable, they would say that they are not a fit candidate for marriage. And I know that's a hot button subject in our own culture today because people, you know, talk about, you know, wanting to have children and it is a tragic thing. I'm not saying that it's it's something we need to be callous about, but it is a question of if marriage is intended for the next generation as much as it is for uh, holding together this one, then there are certain things that will prohibit you from entering into it because you won't be able to fulfill what it was intended to do. And it wouldn't right. just be barrenness. Sterility or, or impotency would also qualify in the same way. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are actually some rather famous examples of marriages being uh, nullified uh, due to impotency throughout history and some rather famous people. But, you know, check out Wikipedia or your local library if you want to learn more about that. Uh, <laughs> What would be some other what would be some other impediments? I mean, I, I think along those lines, and there's there's a list within a quote from Gerhard on page two sixty two if if the listener has Walther's pastoral theology. And it goes along with what Zelwin is saying because the connection between marriage and procreation is presumed both by Walther and by everyone he's quoting. So number two on the list of impediments to marriage, of which he has eleven is the use of means to cause infertility. And I think that a lot of the discussion of things like gay marriage or the presumption of childlessness on the part of people who are getting married, all of that occurs because we have lost the link between marriage and procreation, which is really the biblical purpose. The blessing is be fruitful and multiply. And if we understood it that way, then gay marriage would never have entered into the picture because it's simply, obviously, impossible. Well, and even for a lot of even for a lot of Christian couples, see this this comes about for them in an earnest way where they see marriage as just an outlet for sex, right? For for itself, yeah. and and they kind of borrow from Paul. You know, it's better to marry than to burn, and then that's pretty much what they see. Begins Th- as if that's yeah. the. Yeah, that's the biblical reason for marriage, so that we can have an outlet to channel this energy. But you can't just read Paul at the expense of Genesis. And you can't assume that Paul is somehow telling you something different from what was told to Adam and Eve in the garden. I mean, that mandate is for our parents, Adam and Eve, and it's continued on down down through us. And And you do see this a lot specifically in Christian communities, Christian colleges, you know, young people at that marriage age things happen, you know? And so they're like, well, Paul, better to marry than to burn, better to marry than to burn. And that's all they ever sort of hear about it. Hmm. And, and you would be surprised at how a person can grow up in, in, in certain Christian groups and never really hear about procreation as being important. It's, it's treated just like the secular world does. Well, that's your option if you want to do it. 
Right. But wouldn't you but wouldn't you rather have this car or this <laughs> dog or or get to, you know, quit your job and travel for a year, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so it, it's been indoctrinated into people. And and sometimes in an earnest way, in a sincere way, in kind of a backdoor way. And that that's the tragedy of it all. It it hasn't just been, you know, the counterculture movement that's done this and, you know, hippies didn't just infect people's minds. It was in many cases, the church doing it inadvertently there. Yeah. And there, there, I mean, it's important to clarify because Walther really doesn't discuss it. There is a vast difference between getting married and, and, and finding out that God is not giving you children, which is his prerogative. There's a vast Mm -hmm. difference between that and getting married in order to frustrate God's general and express will to bring children into the world through marriage. There's there's all the world's difference in finding out that it is not his will to give you children versus attempting actively to frustrate his will within your marriage. Yeah, and and if you're married and then come to find out that that you're infertile, that doesn't nullify the marriage. Right. And, that, right. and that's not a reason to um, Abraham doesn't I mean, look at Abraham, that's the one that I was on point to, right? Mm-hmm. But Abraham doesn't just run on well. The middle part of the story gets complicated, I suppose. But uh... <laughs> I mean, I mean, Abraham. Yeah, I mean, Abraham wants a workaround. I mean, it, it, yeah. to go back to the perennial but, thing, like but he doesn't get it. Yeah, but he doesn't I mean, get it. Right. I mean, Abraham wants a workaround. He basically, I mean, that if you if you want to figure out what you're supposed to think about the notion of pregnancy surrogacy in contemporary times, look at Hagar. I mean, it was tried, and everyone ultimately gets really confused about what they're supposed to be thinking and feeling. It is a mess. Don't do it. Don't try to work around God's appointed means. It, it never it never ends well. Submitting to the will of God is oftentimes difficult and, and painful. And we don't want to make light of that situation. Like we're not telling, well, just get over it. You know, suck it up. That's not what we're... <laughs> what we're saying here, but it is a profound thing to acknowledge what the scriptures say, says about fertility. God is the one who opens and closes the womb. Well, I mean, if, if you want to take it a, a step further too, marriage is not something that God gave us for us to do what we will with it. If we are serious about God being the one who joins us together, then we need to let God be the one who actually puts us into that estate. And so it is a, a serious thing to to contemplate. We we don't want to just imagine that it's our play thing, which is, I think, unfortunately, what happens when we think of it purely in individualistic terms. Right. Did you come to till the soil and nurture the garden, or are you just playing in the sandbox? <laughs> till the soil and nurture the vine is what I was trying to say there, but, <laughs> you know, we're going to mix some metaphors here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, th- I think that a lot of Christians understand this for everything except marriage, right? So even sure. even very liberal Christians want to talk about, let's say, the world or the environment as gods, and therefore we have to be good stewards of it. Lots of Christians of all stripes want to talk about being stewards of God's money. Just so also with things like your fertility and your calling as a husband or wife, it is not yours to dispose of as you want to. It is God's gift, and you use it in God's ways. And, and it's there in God's ways, no matter what the world says, that you actually find blessing, whether with your money or in your marriage. And we have just a couple minutes left in this segment. Are there any other impediments to marriage that you guys would like to bring up here, just to highlight a couple more? Well, there's leprosy. So <laughs> if I had a nickel yeah. every time. Yeah. So, I mean, hot topics, I know. I know <laughs> difficult issues for our contemporary world. There is something that you notice as you read, Walther, which is there are things that once you are already married, if they develop, you suffer them. So if your spouse develops an incurable disease, once you are married, you suffer that. That is your cross to bear. However, if you are not already married and you are either suffering from an incurable disease or might be marrying somebody who's suffering an incurable disease, you know, maybe don't go ahead with the marriage. 
You just ruined the entire plot of a walk to remember. You, I, uh, I know. You, you <laughs> crushed the dreams of many girls. Well, so, our did, age, guys. so did all these <laughs> all these dusty old theologians too. I mean, it, it's you know they are not. Let's say it this way: they are not sentimental about marriage. They look at marriage much more as someone else's to set up, i.e., God's. And we deal with his conditions for what he has set it up to be, which is for the continuation of the human race unto generations until he decides that that the world has come to an end. Until then, we are stewards of what he has given us, and we work under his conditions as his servants. They're they're not sentimental about it, and and it, and that is notable. They don't look at it as this is the fulfillment of every deep feeling I've ever had. And maybe that's why they stayed married much more often and much longer than we, than we ever do, because they were do, they were doing work God had given them to do rather than focusing on how they felt about it at the time. All right, we'll be right back here on A Word Fitly Spoken. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Visit our website, wordfitlyspoken.org. There you'll find new articles each week on the Bible and other topics. You can also join us on Facebook at Wordfitly Posting. That's Wordfitly Posting with a P to discuss anything you've read or heard. Thank you for listening. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. And we're back. One last segment of Word Fitly Spoken, talking CFW author and marriage. So now we come to the uh, third rail of marriage discussions, the perennial hot button issue for us today. It's not gay marriage, actually. It's a uh, divorce. The concept of divorce, biblical grounds for it, and what do we do with it? So how does Walter treat this subject, guys? He treats it at length, which people may be surprised by, and. It is entirely possible that if you did some kind of survey of, you know, marriage records and divorce proceedings in 17th century Germany, that the percentage of all marriages ending in divorce would be significantly lower than in the United States today. However, very hard cases perennially come up. People perennially have problems with their marriage. The question is not so much whether or not we will have difficult situations. It is what we will do about them. And I would say that if the church is not invested in upholding biblical standards for marriage and therefore also for divorce, which we'll discuss, then the church sounds rather hollow when it tries to uphold biblical standards for the idea that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. It is that for life part of marriage that, if not upheld, really eviscerates the idea that we are trying to be consistent about marriage and we're upholding biblical marriage and the family when we're trying to oppose gay marriage. All the while, we are extremely permissive if your desires are only for the opposite sex. So it is important to get this right. And Walther lays out two grounds for divorce, although he differentiates between them starkly. Is there anything that you want to add to that, Zelwyn, or or do you want to go into the grounds? I think we should go into the grounds because I think that's where the, the meat of this section comes in. So. How do you guys want to lay this out? I mean, Zelwyn, do you do you have anything to contribute about divorce on account of adultery that that you think people wouldn't grasp right away, or or you really wanted to mention? No, I mean, because when when Christ is talking about divorce being permitted because of adultery, I think that's a fairly straightforward thing for us. In fact, Walter himself doesn't even spend that much time on it because I think we understand instinctively that to 
break the, the marriage bond through an act of blatant adultery is something that's going to constitute grounds for divorce. I mean, it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing, even in the Gospels. And in his formulation, in Walther's formulation, he says, before saying that this is permissible on grounds of adultery, he said, if the guilty party shows repentance, the pastor should first of all admonish the innocent party to forgive and reconcile. Because the goal in a Christian marriage whatever the topic is, whatever the situation is, is that the marriage would remain, if at all possible, and that the conscience should not be burdened either by unrepented sin or by silence or hostility persisting between husband and wife, that everyone, everything would be open, everything would be handled graciously, and that each would love the other. Where that is not possible, it is the pastor's goal, it is the church's goal to make that possible once again. So even where you're talking about an explicit grounds for divorce that our Lord has outlined in Matthew 19, nonetheless, the pastor's first duty, and obviously, therefore, also the first duty of husband and wife, is to seek reconciliation, if at all possible, in in this life. The goal should never be I mean, it would be very sort of suspicious if your husband commits adultery and you're like, all right, well, I got grounds for divorce. See you later. You know, it really kind of makes you wonder, you know, is it, it's almost like you were hoping that would happen or something, right? So, yeah. 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 Well, is it is it too much to say that um, even though our Lord permits divorce in this case, divorce is still... I mean, it's it's not like this is a oh, this is a god pleasing solution to the situation. This is this is a a necessary reality in some cases where reconciliation is impossible, but it's still something that should try to be avoided at all costs. Yeah, I mean, a divorce is always a tragedy because you cannot have a divorce without sin. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not saying that with grounds that the divorce itself is a sin, but there is a grievous sin that has to be committed before divorce can be permitted. And mm-hmm. and so it always is messy and it always is tragic when it happens. Mm-hmm. So the, the Lord isn't delighting in this, even if he's put these provisions in place. You know, so, so we shouldn't, you know, think about a divorce as some kind of good thing, even if it gives somebody a quote unquote out of a bad situation. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we tend to look at it that way like, whew, man, really glad I got that. Now, now there is some truth, you know, the laws concerning the divorce decree and that kind of thing being a protection for the spouse who's who's left with nothing. But that's that's really a different issue. But it's it's kind of like you were saying earlier, Adam, about oh well, I've been sinned against, so here I already had these divorce papers ready just in case. <laughs> you know, yeah, we we have to look at it for what it is, and it's not something to be taken lightly. We live in an age of no-fault divorce. The no-fault divorce is one of the greatest evils ever inflicted upon man. No-fault divorces are absolutely wicked, and we need to do away with that. We need to bring the we need to bring the laws back that made it harder to get a divorce. Simply for the, for this reason, divorce is treated lightly, and then marriage is entered into lightly, and we made a mockery of the institution. And and I, maybe I'm, I'm coming in a little hot here, but you, you've absolutely seen it. You've seen people's lives absolutely ruined because people didn't want to didn't want to work, didn't want to put up with this person or whatever. Families torn apart, you know, people just bankrupted, all sorts of things simply because no fault divorce. Well, that's a, uh, one thing to point out there too. With all of this, again, if we're emphasizing the fact that marriage is not a purely individualistic thing, you know, it's not just about me and my feelings. Divorce is not simply dividing up what God has brought together. It's actually deeply affecting the lives of all of those connected to that family. And in the case of, especially in biblical times and even in Walther's own time, to be divorced would mean that a, like a woman, for example, might not have any means of support. And so she would be left out in the cold. She would basically, her life would be in danger because she would, you know, have to be thrown on to other resources. So, I mean, we we t- don't tend to think of it in those terms because, again, we're so focused on our feelings. But really, I mean, we look at the children, you know, 
I mean, that's the one we look at the most nowadays is how children are affected by divorce. And it ain't good. There has never been a period in history, civilly speaking, where it was that easy to put away a spouse. And uh, and I don't think it's been I don't think it's proven to be good for us as a as a society. But this is something Walter wouldn't have predicted. I mean, you could get divorces. It it, it wasn't it, in the 1800s. In it's not that hard in the West to get a divorce. But it certainly wasn't quite as simple as it was today. You go you go to Amazon and buy divorce law for dummies, and you can almost do it yourself as long as your check clears. And, and so again, he he's not really predicting this. But he's also seeing marriages break up. And what would happen in, in those days, which is more common than getting a divorce, was simply abandonment. The husband or the wife just, just runs off. Right. And right. then you're kind of stuck. <laughs> you have this, you're legally married to someone who has disappeared. And it was easy to disappear on the prairie in America. The other, the other grounds for divorce on which he spends a great deal more time because it is a great deal more nebulous than adultery is summed up in that phrase, malicious desertion. Non-malicious desertion would be, you know, you go to war and become a POW and you're gone for years. You know, it's it's not your fault. You didn't try to run away. But malicious desertion is you ran away from house and home, wife and children, and you are gone. That's actually a clear-cut example and is what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 7, where this text comes up. If the spouse runs away, the brother or sister is free, free to marry again because the other person has gone away and is, as it were, dead. In fact, may be dead. Malicious desertion, however, certainly in modern times where Christians are still trying to justify divorce on biblical grounds, uh, any, any given divorce, malicious desertion is where you drive the 18-wheeler of feelings through in order to justify your divorce. So I have seen any number of situations that did not constitute abandonment classified as malicious desertion in order to justify a divorce, even for clergymen. I've seen this happen. Yeah, because, I mean, because like you say, you have the clear-cut example of he's just straight gone. Right. But then the question is, is, you know, well, what constitutes being gone? Mm -hmm. Can you be emotionally gone can you be <laughs> yeah he's uh, he's playing settlers of Catan gone. down at the uh, rec center you know <laughs> six days a week he's really obsessed with his miniatures or something yeah 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 i mean i i think that sometimes and and, and it's not like walter is unaware of really hard situations but i think sometimes simply because our laws are so permissive and the penalties, even within the church, are non-existent for doing what is contrary to God's will, people would rather get divorced rather than work through the problems. I think it is significant that, that because of the way that our legal system is set up, divorces are initiated in 70% of cases in the United States by women because they stand to gain and not to lose from divorce. Men generally lose access to their children from divorce and have to pay for those children and for that woman to some extent. Anyway, women stand to gain, which is why in our society, they tend to initiate divorces more often than not. But it is at the point where something that Walther never anticipates, which is that clergymen would be divorced and or remarried, is also not unknown, even within our own, our own confessional Lutheran circles. Yeah, and that's the thing, though. That is very recent. It was just unheard of until really very recently in Christian history. Would you say like the last 30 years, 40 years? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe stretch into 40 because I forget, you know, we're in 2018 now. <laughs> but I'd say yeah, definitely since the 70s, moving up into the 80s. Yeah. It just, it just wasn't even... We're talking about it's only been within that time that if a guy broke off an engagement and was at the seminary, his future was in question. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that that's not been that long ago at all. But because of the way we have begun to perceive marriage and divorce kind of as an entitlement, uh, we m perhaps look at ordination in a similar way in certain groups. Yeah. Certain yeah. denominations. It is, it is my entitlement, right? Yeah. And it's worth talking about. It's a very sensitive subject, but 
why why do you think the theologians were so strict on this point for centuries? I think the reason is at least twofold. One is that the notion that the pastor is the husband of one wife and above reproach and governing his household well is simply a clear idea in scripture. It's really not that difficult to interpret. I think also because it is clear from what is written both in Walther and in any other older pastoral theology you may care to consult that, as I was saying earlier, they were willing to put in the hard work of valuing the church and the offices within the church or the family and the roles within the family as God has set those things up over the feelings and the personal struggles of the individual people occupying those offices or roles. It is int- it is telling that they don't identify the husband one wife thing with polygamy, for example. Right, right, right. They don't say, oh, well, he just couldn't be a polygamist, as if all the yeah. other Christians could be somehow in the first century. <laughs> right. right. I mean, it's it's absurd on its face, but but most self-justification is. If you dig a little under the surface in any self-justification, whether it is, well, I can still be a pastor because it wasn't my fault. Well, no, that's ex- that's exactly the opposite of what Paul says. The man is always responsible, even if the wife committed the adultery. It is still his failure. Ergo, he can be a Christian, but he cannot occupy the pastoral office anymore. I mean, it's it's like saying, well, you know, the guy under me at City Hall is the one who embezzled money. Yeah, but you're the mayor. You were on watch. He was your employee, and you failed too. You let this happen. That's a failure in your administration, your governance as well. So the idea that somehow the man is not responsible if the wife goes off the rails, that, that does not, that's part of being the head. You are in charge also when things go wrong. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, but we're even, we we'll even see examples and very popular examples of cases where the pastor is actually quite literally at fault. Right. Uh, not not indirectly or implicitly, but explicitly at fault, and then almost immediately being restored to the office. Yeah, I think that something that people do not realize when they when they celebrate this as if it is some great achievement of grace to have done something heinous. We saw this with Tully and Chavijan, we see this with Chad Bird. When this happens, people do not realize, as they do not realize when they are getting a divorce what this will do to people in the future. They do not realize what it means for people to see sin magnified and celebrated, especially as if it were some great celebration of how great Christ's forgiveness is. Because look at the horrendous thing I did to somebody else, and he forgave me, and here I am probably making money off of it now. When that happens, they do not understand what that means. I can tell you that if I had known about, especially those two men, when I was a new Christian, I would have thought, well, what am I doing any of this for? Because it's obvious that Christians don't care about what the Bible says. To honor the institution, the office, the text, God's words over our own feelings and predilections is to set up both for Christians and non-Christians, both for the strengthening of the church and for the proclamation of the gospel to the unbeliever, that God is supreme over us and we are his servants and we follow his words and we do what he says, even when it's hard, and we go silent where we ought to be silent in shame. We do not set our own egos or predilections or feelings over marriage, which he has instituted, or over the holy office, which he has set up to feed his church. We don't do that because he is the Lord. We are not. He is God. We are his creatures. So none of this is arbitrary, and nobody is saying that any of this is easy, but we are saying that God's word must prevail. If it does not, we have no future. We destroy things even where we think we are magnifying God most greatly when we let our feelings prevail over his word. Zelman, you've been a little quiet over there. Do you have anything you'd like to add? (laughs) What am I going to add after that? (laughs) I don't know. Can you sing? (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, I don't know what else to say other than 
if we're going to let the Bible be the Bible, we have to listen to what it says. I mean, that's kind of what we've been harping on for several episodes now. Well, maybe harping is too strong a word, but but but, but the point is clear. I mean, the word is the word, and we are called to listen to the word and not to try to shape the word into our own ideas of what we think it should be. Right. It, this goes back to what we were saying just one or two episodes ago. It's very easy and very pleasing to the ear to do theology via slogan, via platitude, you know, these these sort of niceties that we've come to do, and these labels that we've slapped on ourselves to identify ourselves as, as part of this camp or that camp. But at the end of the day, what has God said? What has God revealed in his word? And that's what we ought to be bound to. Slogans and whatever be damned, we are bound to what God has revealed. And we ought to have the humility, at least, to know that God's ways are better than our ways, even when it stings, even when it hurts. God still loves us. Christ's forgiveness is still there, but there are consequences to what we do. And the scriptures are very clear when they are presented. This ties into everything, not just marriage and divorce, but really all all spheres of life and all people in all their various vocations as husband, wife, father, son, daughter, whatever. So yeah, good stuff, guys. Any any final words before we wrap it up here? Yeah, I think on this topic, the listener can look most clearly at the stories of David and Solomon, you know, the greatest kings of the United Israel. And you have only to consult their lives in order to see the generational destruction that occurs when you place yourself over God's word and you try to become its judge rather than submitting to it. You may be enjoying what you're doing. It may seem right in your own eyes, but what seems right to a man may be the way to death. And so this is, this is, a, this is a call in this case specifically about marriage, but as you said, concerning all things, to submit ourselves to God's word. That is the best thing for the coming generations. That is the best way to honor faithful forefathers. And that is the best way to live with a good conscience in our marriages and in everything else, to live with a good conscience in the fear of God all the days of our lives. Because one day we will appear before his judgment seat and we will have to answer for what we say and for what we do and for how we have lived. And we want to do that, as Paul says, with a blameless conscience, with faith unfeigned and with love issuing from a sincere heart. And in doing so, the best way to do that, the only way to do that is to submit ourselves to his word in all things. Thank you very much, Adam. We hope to have you back for another episode on how to die right, because <laughs> this has been a very, very fruitful discussion. Again, thank you as always. Thank you. Always a pleasure. This is a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard, have questions, want to contact us, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, Twitter at wordfitly, or facebook.com slash wordfitly. Also check out our discussion group, Word Fitly Posting, on Facebook. That's Word Fitly Posting with a P. I'm Willie Grills here with Zell and Heidi. Again, thank you, Adam. God love you all, and God bless.